Oh, hi there. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. I'm Liv, that person who talks to you through your headphones or maybe your car stereo. Who am I to say? Thank you all for tuning in once again. Right up at the top, I'm going to give you all a quick plea. Please, if you haven't already, subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen. Here's the deal. Complete downloads are what count as monthly downloads for me. Subscribing means it will automatically download. This is how I track listenership and how I can attract advertisers. It would be super fucking cool if one day this could be my job. I could bring you way more content and maybe even more podcasts in general. But in order to do that, I need steady advertisers and those come with downloads. So if you like this podcast, please, in addition to leaving me a glowing five-star review on iTunes, subscribe wherever you listen. Thank you. Love all you wonderful nerds. I also want to let you know that due to popular demand, I'll be setting up a recommended book list on my website. As many of you know, I have this currently on my Instagram highlights, but I'll make a proper list on the website as well. So stay tuned for that. And also per many of your requests, I'm working on a way for you to all be able to donate to the show in the form of books that I can use for the podcast. I'm against using Amazon for most, if not everything, but especially books. I won't go into my whole rant, but oh, how I could. So I'm working with an independent bookstore here in Victoria to work out a way for any of you who want to, to purchase a book from a specific list of mine of books that would help the podcast. And then I would simply pick it up from the bookstore. So once it's finalized, I'm going to put online and announce it officially. But there you go. It's in the works since lots of you have asked about doing that through Amazon, but I won't do Amazon. Thank you for listening to my initial business, but with that out of the way, oh, the Odyssey. Well, we're back with Odysseus and somehow already in part six, because I don't know how to summarize something as wonderful as Homer, but who really wants to anyway. This is Odysseus, after all. You are getting all the dirty details because those dirty details are awesome. Where we last left my main man, he was telling the Phaeacians about his trip to the underworld how he spoke with Tiresias, as Circe instructed him to, and how he learned from his mother about what had been going on in Ithaca all his time away, and how Persephone then sent so many women from myths we know and love to tell him their stories, how they were treated, and what they, in turn, did to others. It's all very dramatic. I'd recommend you read that section, as I couldn't do it justice. And seriously, read Emily Wilson's translation, because it's incredible, but also support women, especially women in a field that is so, so, so dominated by old white men. But I digress, as per usual. Odysseus has just interrupted his own story with the Phaeacians, even though they were all paying rapt attention. Odysseus, on the other hand, needs sleep. Which brings us to... Episode 52, In the Underworld, Dead Men Still Whine. The Odyssey, Part 6 Sing muses of Odysseus in the land of the dread goddess Persephone. After Odysseus tells the Phaeacians that he must stop his story so that he might finally get some sleep, it isn't the king who speaks in response to this declaration, nor any other man in the room. The first voice we hear after so much of Odysseus' own is the queen, Arete. She fawns over Odysseus, just as impressed by his story as anyone else. Oh, this man, this handsome man with a mind to be envious of. Arete asks the lords gathered for their part not to be rid of Odysseus too quickly, not to let him leave the land of the Phaeacians without all the treasure he could possibly use on this, his, fingers crossed, final journey home to Ithaca. The king Alcinous agrees, urging the rest of the lords to follow the instructions of his wife and heap gifts on Odysseus. He suggests that Odysseus sleep now, and they will all do exactly this in the morning so that Odysseus can be on his way. Now, Odysseus, one would think, would be super keen on this timeline. Like, give me prezies and don't keep me much longer. But it seems there's some greed in the heart of old Odysseus, because not only does he agree, he says that even if the king urged him to stay a full year, he'd do it so long as he got to bring home loads of treasure. So, you know, dude wants that treasure. 
Meanwhile, Alcinous is not done hearing stories. The king manages to convince Odysseus that he doesn't need sleep quite yet, and that he should instead continue on. Odysseus isn't one to turn down the rapt attention of a crowd of listeners, and so we're back in his story, back in the underworld where he tells his assembled fans that Persephone has sent the women to speak to him, and once they'd finished telling their incredible stories, next appears Agamemnon. Agamemnon's shade appears with all the other men who died in Argos upon his return home from war, killed by Clytemnestra and Aegisthus. Agamemnon, too, drinks the blood, and so when he does, he recognizes his friend Odysseus and is desperate for a hug from his old pal. Odysseus asks him what happened, how he got there. Did he die at sea, drowned by Poseidon, or by enemies en route as he tried to get home? As we know, though, Agamemnon wasn't killed by either of those, so he tells Odysseus what happened. Agamemnon tells Odysseus about Aegisthus, how he returned home from Troy and was welcomed by his wife and Aegisthus before being brutally murdered along with the rest of his men. He tells his tale very dramatically, ensuring he's depicted as quite the victim. There's talk of blood running beneath the tables of a banquet, of poor Cassandra's cries. No mention of why so-called poor Cassandra was there in the first place. No admission of, hey, maybe it's too bad I kidnapped this girl to be my sex slave only to have her killed by my wife and her new boyfriend. Anyway, it's all very dramatic and showy with lots of talk of blood and swords and deceit. In the end, though, Agamemnon tells Odysseus that this is how he came to be here, in the underworld, in the kingdom of Hades and Persephone. On hearing Agamemnon's story of his own tragic death, Odysseus cries out, naming specifically that curse on the house of Atreus, the one that's resulted in such wonderful myths to, for me to tell to you. I'm personally very grateful for the curse, but then I didn't get killed by my wife and her boyfriend. Ah, oh, Agamemnon. At this discussion of the deceit and murderous behavior of his wife, his response is not to question anything in himself, not to wonder if perhaps he drove his wife to some of this madness, what with, you know, the sacrificing of her daughter and the bringing home a sex slave from war. No, Agamemnon has some advice for Odysseus. That advice is to never treat your wife too well. Mm -hmm, yeah, never be too nice to your wife, Agamemnon advises Odysseus. Don't tell her everything. Tell her only some things. But he does conclude, after this awesome advice, that Odysseus' own wife, Penelope, is far too wise to ever kill him. So, I mean, I guess that's nice. He admits that women do have the capacity to not be murderous harpies, just not all of them. So do be careful, men. But... Agamemnon says, even though your wife is smart and somehow, therefore, unlikely to kill you, Agamemnon tells Odysseus still to be careful, not to anchor his ship too directly in sight of Ithaca. No, be sneaky, he advises, which, fine, in the end is good advice coming from a real tool, who finishes with, quote, there's no trusting women any longer. Not all women, Agamemnon. Agamemnon's final request is an update on his son, Orestes. Where is he? He asks Odysseus. Is he alive? Is he in Pylos, maybe? Or with Menelaus in Sparta, perhaps? Odysseus is pretty blunt here. Why the fuck would you ask me that? Odysseus kind of says, but with all that testy language. I don't know anything about Orestes, he says. And I'm sure he wishes he could add that he doesn't even know if his own son is alive. Why the fuck would he care whether Agamemnon's son is alive? Agamemnon's shade leaves Odysseus, and he's approached next by... Oh, guys. Guys. Odysseus is approached next by... Oh, Achilles and Patroclus. Oh. And whatever, Antilochus and Ajax come too, but who cares about them? Achilles speaks to Odysseus, asking him, why the hell would he come down to hell? Okay, fine, no, he doesn't say that exactly, but it just suits, you know? Anyway, he asks Odysseus, why ever would he choose to travel to the underworld where only the dead live? 
Odysseus explains to Achilles why he's there, about Tiresias and whatnot. But again, Achilles is more concerned with the people he's left behind, just like Agamemnon was. He asks Odysseus whether he has news on his son, where he is and how he's doing, and about his father, whether he's still leading the Myrmidons in Phythia. Odysseus doesn't have news to share about Peleus, Achilles' father, but he does tell him how his son, Neoptolemus, handled his time after the war, after Achilles' death. He mentions how many men he killed, how brave he was, etc., etc., and he mentions the horse and the Greeks' time hiding in the horse, which I do believe is the first time in Homer that we learn about the Trojan horse, since it doesn't actually figure into the Iliad, which I just find quite interesting. Homer is really finishing the story of the war through these interactions with the shades of his fellow soldiers. Odysseus tells Achilles about his son, and Achilles is satisfied, simply running off into the fields of Asphodel. I'm assuming he's with Patroclus now, because there's no other mention of this, which is a fucking travesty. I want to hear about how happy they are together in the underworld, god fucking damn it. Anyway, whatever, we can all just picture them happy together for eternity and with Achilles being slightly less obnoxious and dickish in death. But Odysseus's visits aren't done. His fellow Greeks who fought and died in the Trojan War are there to visit him. Ajax won't come too close because he's mad about that contest for Achilles' armor. Odysseus makes the case that it wasn't really his fault, he didn't want to win, but Athena and Pallas, they helped him, and he's really sorry again, etc., etc., but Ajax doesn't get over it, and he just leaves. Next, Odysseus sees Minos, son of Zeus and husband of Pasiphae, mother of the Minotaur, who we quite coincidentally relearned about last week. I do love when these things match up so well, because let me assure you, it isn't due to my planning. Minos is there as the judge of the dead, holding a great golden scepter and just hanging out, waiting to hand down judgments. Odysseus sees Orion, forever chasing down the beasts he killed so well in life. He sees Titius, son of Gaia, who stretched out nine miles long. He tells us that when Leto, mother of Apollo and Artemis, was traveling to Pitho, Titius raped her. And so now, in the underworld, two vultures sit on either side of him, ripping at his liver with their beaks and stabbing him in the bowels. To which I say, why are there so few rape punishment stories like this? Great punishment. I mean, just A-plus stuff here. He sees Tantalus desperately in need of a drink and some food, but unable to get to either. And Sisyphus pushing his boulder up a hill, pushing with all his might just for it to roll back down every time. He sees the phantom of Heracles himself, happy feasting with the deathless gods of the underworld. Heracles recognizes Odysseus and calls out to him, complaining about those labors he had to do. Which, I mean, time to maybe move on, Heracles. You're fucking Heracles. More spirits surround Odysseus, but their cries start to scare him, and even though he desperately wants to see the heroes Theseus and Perithous specifically, he's kind of scared that maybe Persephone and all her amazing dread goddessiness would actually just send out the head of Medusa and turn him to stone, so he decides to just leave instead of risking it. Odysseus and his men sail away from the underworld, all the way back to the island of Aiaia, the island of our very own witchy woman, Circe. In the morning, the men go back to Circe's palace and find the body of their dead friend Elpinor, he who had drunkenly fallen off a building, which we're definitely not laughing about, but honestly, what a way to go in a Greek myth. Not killed by another hero or by Chimera or some shit. No, dude got drunk and fell. They get Elpinor's body and perform the necessary rites, having a funeral pyre for him and mourning profusely. Circe greets the men who've returned to her. She's welcoming and thrilled that they succeeded in traveling to the underworld and back again. She offers them food and to stay there all day drinking wine. What an offer. I wish I could spend all day drinking wine on Aiaia. Next, Circe tells them that they may be off the very next morning, finally to return to Ithaca, and that she'll explain their route in great detail so that they won't encounter anyone or anything that could prevent them from returning home. Fine a fucking Lee. The men and Circe eat and drink all day until it's very late. Most then go to sleep, 
But Cersei pulls Odysseus aside so she can tell him exactly how they must reach Ithaca. She tells him that first he'll encounter the sirens, women who bewitch anyone who hears their song. If anyone nears the sirens or hears their singing, they'll never travel home, never see their wives and children. The sirens sit in their own meadow, ready to seduce anyone and everyone to their deaths. They sit on piles of dead men as the flesh rots away. They're really very, very lovely. So, Circe tells Odysseus, use wax to block your ears so you're deaf to their song. But, she continues, if you want to hear their song, you could consider tying yourself to the mast of the ship and giving your men the wax to block their ears. After the sirens, you must let your heart decide which route, because, you know, neither are good or easy. The first option, Circe tells Odysseus, is to go through these enormous hanging rocks where Amphitrite, queen of the sea, throws crashing waves all day long. These are called the wandering rocks, and not even birds can fly through them and survive. No mortal ship has ever done it successfully, because when they try, there are waves, but also raging gusts of fire. Fire. Only the Argo has ever made it, she tells him, but that was with the help of Hera. So, you know, great first option, totally survivable, and definitely not insane. Next option, Circe tells Odysseus, you meet two rocks. One is so tall you can't see the top. It's perpetually surrounded by fog. No light makes it through the fog, and no one could ever climb the rock. It's so smooth it's as if it were polished. In the middle of this insurmountable rock, is a cave. Avoid this cave, Circe warns Odysseus, with a note of real drama in her voice. It's so high you could never shoot at it, nor defend yourself from what's in it. And what's in the cave is Scylla. <sighs> Scylla. Now Homer's description here is a bit different from what I gave you in her origin story those weeks ago. Here Scylla howls and barks, even the gods are afraid of her. She has twelve legs and six long necks with terrifying heads on each, and in each face on her six heads is three rows of razor-sharp teeth, quote, pregnant with death. Scylla watches from her cave, hunting for fish, dolphins, even whales. She's always there, always ready to catch anyone who sails near her cave. No sailors have ever passed without harm. Her six long necks are always ready to snatch men right off their ships. Odysseus at this point, I imagine, would just be staring at Circe, dumbfounded. Like, I'm sorry, what's my second option? It sounds just as fucking insane as the first option. <clears throat> Circe might say, giving Odysseus a look. I'm not finished describing your second option. To which I think Odysseus would simply gulp and start to sweat profusely. On the other rock, opposite this rock of Scylla, Circe continues, grows a fig tree. Oh, Odysseus might stop and think, that doesn't sound so bad. And then Circe would give him another look and tell him she's not fucking finished. Beneath the fig tree, divine Charybdis, a vicious whirlpool, sucks water down into the depths of the sea. Three times a day she does this, the power of this whirlpool unmatched and certainly not able to be beaten by speed or force. Row fast, Circe instructs. Avoid Charybdis entirely, sailing closer to Scylla's rock. It's better, she tells him, to lose six men to Scylla's six heads than everyone to Charybdis's death whirlpool. Odysseus, I imagine, would just stare blankly at Circe, since in my head he interrupted her enough that he thinks this can't possibly be it. There must be some other horrific death awaiting him as he tries to get through this one part of the sea. What options? But no, Circe's done. These are his options. Good, easy options. Finally, Odysseus speaks. Is there seriously no other way? Is there no way to avoid Charybdis while also avoiding Scylla's heads? He asks. Circe, I think, sighs loudly here. No, you dummy! Didn't you hear me? 
You're not in a man's war now. You're at the mercy of the gods, and there are very different rules here. You must surrender to the gods. Scylla is not a mortal to be avoided or beaten. You can't fight her. You just need to get past her, and quickly. Get past her as quickly as possible, Circe tells Odysseus, before she can strike again with her six heads and end up with twelve of your men instead of only six. Get past her and head straight to the island of Thrinacia, where Helios's sheep and cattle live. There, two goddesses watch over the herds, daughters of Helios. If you can hold on to the image of home and leave those fucking sheep and cattle alone, she tells him without using the word fuck, you'll be able to get home to Ithaca. But, she says, if you damage these animals in any way, your ship will meet with disaster, and even if you survive, you'll arrive home very late and in disgrace for causing the death of all your men. And I love that statement here because, reminder, it's coming from a man who's telling the story of how it took him nine years to get to Phaeacia and why he has no other men with him. <laughs> so, I mean, I wonder what's going to happen. By the time Circe has finished giving these instructions to Odysseus, it's morning. He wakes his men and they prepare to sail off finally, fingers fucking crossed, back to Ithaca. Circe gives them good wind, they feel rested and ready, and they're off. Once they're en route, Odysseus tells the men what he knows, and before long, they begin to near the island of the Sirens. Once they're close, the wind dies down completely, sending an eerie calm over the seas around the ship. They use this time to prepare. Odysseus readies the wax, shoving it into each of the man's ears, They tie him up, securing him soundly to the mast in the center of the ship. When they're prepared, the men take oars to the calm seas and slowly make their way toward the island of the Sirens. Odysseus, come here. Famous Odysseus, pride of the Greeks, stop here on our island and listen to our voices. All who pass here are sweet, soothing songs. Our music makes them happy. Our music makes them go on their journey with more knowledge and joyous that they've heard our song. We know all that was suffered in Troy by the Greeks and the Trojans too. Through the will of the gods, we know all that has happened anywhere on earth. The song of the sirens is so beautiful and intriguing to Odysseus that he begs his men to free him. He wants to hear their song and learn their knowledge, but the men keep on rowing. They tie Odysseus even tighter to the mast. Finally, the song of the sirens dies out, and silence once again falls on Odysseus. He motions to the men that they may remove the wax from their ears and untie him. They're no longer at risk from the sirens, and they did well by not untying him even when he begged. There's a huge wave and a roar and even smoke in the distance, and the men of Odysseus' ship are, rightfully, terrified of what's to come next. So he speaks to them, reminding them that they've been through worse, that they escaped the Cyclops, and they can escape this. He doesn't tell them about Scylla, though. They can't really avoid her. So why prepare them for six of their deaths? He instructs the men steering to avoid the smoke and the waves and steer towards the sheer, smooth rock. Odysseus chooses to ignore one of Circe's warnings, though. He's not willing to just stand by as they sail past Scylla, so he arms himself, putting on his armor and grabbing spears, ready to defend them as much as he can. As they near Scylla, Charybdis gurgles angrily on the other side, spewing water up before sucking it back down with incredible force. They all watch as Charybdis gurgles, roars erupting from the rock above her. And while the men are trained terrified on Charybdis. Scylla's six heads snatch six men, the strongest, best fighters, off the ship in a blink. Odysseus watches from below as the men's legs and arms flail, their heads grasped tightly in Scylla's as they scream out Odysseus's name. Thank you all for listening. 
This was a particularly fun episode. Skilla and Charybdis are my favorite, you guys. Oh, the Odyssey. It's just so much fun. It's just, it's so much fun. But, friends, next month, it's June, Pride Month. And so at this point, my plan is to take a brief pause from the wanderings of my precious Odysseus to focus on the stories of LGBTQ characters of mythology. This, as you might imagine, will include one particular story that has been requested more times than I can count, often in ways that leads me to believe that you all think I could possibly be forgetting these characters, but how could I? Anyway, stay tuned for that. It's going to be fun. Please, as usual, rate, review, subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen, but also maybe just rate and review on iTunes also so I can up my discoverability because, again, I'd like to do this full time, but in order to do that, I need more nerds in my life. And tell your friends, that helps too. Just spread the word. Let's get everyone into mythology because it's so fun, but also there's so much we can learn from it. As usual, you can help me keep going with the podcast by either becoming a monthly patron on Patreon, patreon.com slash mythsbabies, where for $5, you'll get my backlog of movie-related podcasts and the upcoming companion episodes that tell you different versions of the stories I've already told. Or for a single one-time donation, you can do that via PayPal. To do that, go to mythsbaby.com and click on Wanna Help? And if you can't help, I totally get it. I appreciate you listeners like hell, but hey, I'm gonna ask, right? Thank you all for the responses to my re-airing of the Lysistrata episode, too. Honestly, I'm constantly expecting to be bombarded with comments and messages from shitty people who take issue with my political commentary. It seems like that's just the nature of the internet. But every time, I'm surprised by how little of that I get and how many wonderful messages of support and appreciation I receive instead. I want to make sure the primary focus of this podcast is the mythology, but at the same time, I have no intention of tempering my own opinions or the inherent feminism that I've already put into so much of this podcast. That's who I am. That's what this show is. And I'm always going to talk about anything important when it's necessary. And right now, God, it's just also necessary. Somehow, even in my own country, there's this growing notion of changing the way we've done things forever to fit this anti-woman narrative that seems to be taking hold of North America. Abortion has never been an issue in Canada in my lifetime. It's always just been an obvious right we have because it's our fucking bodies. It's covered by provincial health care. It is health care. And yet there have been a few rallies and screenings of awful movies lately that have brought out these capital C conservative monsters who have spoken about changing laws that have been on the books for so, so long. It's just all insane bullshit. And we have to all speak up all the time. Anyway, I... Thank you all for listening to that again. (laughs) Didn't mean to go back into it, but there you go. That's all to say, thank you for every message I get, both, you know, about the political stuff and just the general messages I get from you all every day. I honestly read all of them, I promise, but I just can't respond. So I'm sorry if I don't, but know that if you send me an email or a Facebook message or a DM on Instagram or Twitter, I read them all and they make me so, so happy. I can't even tell you. So just... Thank you all. I love you all. You're all so wonderful for listening all the time and for spreading this wonderful mythological love. You're the best. I'm Liv, and I do very much love this shit.